I would like to welcome you all for our first um, live webinar for this <clears throat> for this uh, first semester. Um, and we do really thank Malebohu that is going first in that series and look forward for more uh, series. I can see that we have a number of uh, aspiring fellows that have uh, joined in for this, uh, for this particular seminar, Dan Brooks and, and, and others. So welcome, and I'm sure that we'll recognize um, all of you uh, once Maliboho has made her presentation. But as usual, before we um, delve into this afternoon's, um, this afternoon's presentation, again, uh, a warm welcome from me and, and the team uh, that, that we work with to make sure that you're happy and productive. Um, and secondly, also to welcome in a very special and warm way, Ephraim. Ephraim Maina, Emeritus uh, of Modern Jewish Philosophy from the Department of uh, uh, Jewish Thought at Bar Ilal University in Israel. He's tried to make it here several times, so we're glad that you finally did make it. And Ephraim is one of the members of the group that is working on, on Gandhi's Satyagra. And so welcome, and I can see that you're already linking up uh, so now you can do all the work. They can relax a bit. Uh, third, we say bon voyage to Arked. Um, Arked Ndori Chimpa will be departing at the end of the week. And Arked's next Isolomso residency will be as a fellow of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, CASPERS, at Stanford University as part of their 2021-22 um, fellowship program. So our congratulations to Arked, and we look forward to seeing you here again because Arked has just started his three-year Isolomso uh, program. Um, <clears throat> so for today, uh, maybe before I get to today, I should also express our condolences to our fellow colleagues, Tanzanians, who've lost their president. Uh, John Pombe Magufuli passed on, and so our condolences to the fellows coming from Tanzania and to the um, countrymen and women of Tanzania, Kole Sana. So for today, Professor Rezia Pretorius will introduce the speaker. Our tradition is that for the live webinars, we ask a colleague from outside to introduce the speaker. So don't think that I've abandoned Maleboho. So we will have Professor uh, Rezia Pretorius introducing her. And after the, she's spoken, Christoph will come in to manage the Q and A. So let me introduce Professor uh, Pretorius, and she's going, he, uh, Professor Pretorius is going to do this online. Um, and I hope that we see, we already have, I think, yes. So uh, Rezia is a, 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 a physiologist and full professor and head of department of physiological sciences at the Faculty of Science. Uh, in the University of Stellenbosch. He's an A-rated scientist of the National Research Foundation of South Africa and a member of the Royal Society of South Africa. And the research interest and focus is on cells and proteins in the coagulation system and studies various inflammatory biomarkers and so the relation with our um, speaker this afternoon. Rezia was awarded the NS, NSTP Bilton Distinguished Research Award in 2018. Um, the DST South African Women in Science Award uh, ran up in 2017 and award in 2019. And she was also a finalist in the Standard Bank Top Women Awards in 2019. Previously, Previous awards also include
include African Union Kwame Nkrumah Scientific Awards Program uh, for Basic Science and Technology and African Women in Science and University of Pretoria's um, Exceptional Young Researchers Award in 20, 2008. So I think that she's a very huge inspiration for Maliboho, who I'm sure is going to earn more awards than the ones that I've mentioned, not to put a lot of pressure on her <laughs> as she begins our presentation. So I want to hand over to Rezia to please introduce Maliboho. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just want to apologize. I believe my camera is not working. Um, I'm on leave in a little small town, so I'm trying to connect via my phone. So, um, please, can you just indicate whether you can hear me? Yes. Great. Yes, we can hear you. So it is my greatest pleasure to introduce to you Malabohun Gukwe, one of South Africa's brightest young female professors. I have known Malibuhi since 2017, when she first started talking about pathological blood flow in various inflammatory diseases. She walked into my office and I thought this young lady cannot possibly already have a PhD in mechanical engineering. This week, when I again read through her CV, the same thought crossed my mind. This young academic is simply extraordinary. You will agree with me when you realize that Balaboghe only matriculated in 2005. Her stellar career path started with a BEC in Mechanical Engineering in 2006 at UCT, followed by a DPhil in Engineering Science from the University of Oxford. This degree she received in 2013. She returned to South Africa and to UCT, where she was appointed as a postdoc, followed by a lecturer appointment at Mechanical Engineering in 2015. She is now an associate professor since the beginning of 2021. Malibohan has received numerous notable research grants and key awards that include her final residency as a Zulomo Fellow at STIAS and visiting research fellow in 2019 at Peter Wall Institute of Advanced Studies in Canada. She was also a recipient of the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship for her studies at the University of Oxford. Malabuch has published an impressive 20 papers and she has attended numerous conferences as well as presented various invited talks. I can only end this brief introduction by saying, please join me as I watch the space. This extraordinary young people of flow mechanics. I cannot wait to listen to your talk today. And I'm waiting in anticipation to see how you are going to significantly impact science and medicine. And now over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Rizia, for that very generous introduction. And thank you, too, to Stias for the honor and privilege of being able to deliver this talk today. I'll speak a bit about the role of blood flow in blood clotting and disease, which will spell out the adventure that I've been on in the last few years. You're probably asking yourselves what a mechanical engineer has to do with blood clotting. And a way to begin is to say that one can conceptualize of the heart as a pump and all the arteries and veins as a system of pipes through which blood flows around the body. We can then think about blood clotting as a system that protects those pipes. When injury occurs, we want those pipes to be able to be repaired. And so in essence, that's what the blood clotting system is. To begin by briefly explaining what I'll go through in this talk. I'll first give a brief overview of blood clotting, and then we'll talk about some of the diseases which I've worked on in which clotting is a key feature. 
beginning first with brain or cerebral aneurysm, we'll then move to other vascular diseases, and finally we'll touch on some of the work that I've been privileged to participate in at ACS lab focusing on COVID-19. So if we begin by thinking about how blood clotting works, the diagram over here in the portion labeled A shows a representation of a blood vessel with blood flowing through its center. Under normal conditions, when there's no injury, the endothelium is the layer that comes into direct contact with flowing blood and is usually intact. This layer separates the rest of the layers in the blood vessel from the flowing blood. What's also interesting to note in the circle is that within the blood, there's a whole host of cells and proteins that's all, that also float about. And some of these participate in the clotting process. It's important to point out that normally these circulate around in an inactive state, so they don't spontaneously cause clots. When an injury occurs, as seen in the diagram labeled B, there's typically some kind of disruption to that endothelial layer. And when that happens, the subendothelial layers are exposed, bringing them into direct contact with the flowing blood. And that sends signals into the blood to say there's a problem, there's a gap in the wall, we need to recruit cells and proteins to the site of damage in order to fill that gap. And that's exactly what happens. The platelets are then recruited to the site of injury and they attach and become activated, which means they can then hold on to each other. However, they're still susceptible to the flow that's going past and can be easily dislodged. So a whole series of reactions between the other proteins also takes place to form what we call a fibrin net to hold the platelets in place until healing has occurred. Now, there are three main things that we can take from that process. And that is that clotting is a careful balance between the constitution of blood. And when I say that, I mean what makes up the blood, the kinds of cells and the proteins that are circulating therein. And this can be different from person to person. Some people don't clot enough, like hemophiliacs, and other people clot too much, so they may have different constitutions of blood. The other important part is the blood flow which is responsible for the transportation of those cells and proteins. And then the third key part, which we also spoke about, is the injury to the vessel wall. Typically, in healthy conditions, unless there's injury, clots don't form spontaneously. And this is known as Virchow's triad, which was initially presented in the 1800s, so a very long time ago. And the field of clotting has since come a very long way. But these three key ideas are still very helpful for thinking about the key parts that participate in the clotting process. As I said, this balance is carefully maintained under health. But sometimes in the cases of disease, we deviate from some of these features in key significant ways. And so the first case that we'll consider is that of brain or cerebral aneurysms. So to simply explain what an aneurysm is, if one considers an artery that's made up of a wall, an aneurysm is basically a section where that wall weakens, resulting in a ballooning out of the wall, and like a balloon, it's at risk of rupture. So if we first look at the image on the left, what we'll see is a network of blood vessels on the brain injected with some kind of dye, which is what gives them the color. And the little region circled in red is the aneurysm or the aneurysm bulge. You'll see there's a sort of circular blob there. And if we zoom into what that actually looks like in the diagram on the right-hand side, the red region is the aneurysm which has ballooned out because of weakening. It would have originally sat here. And the gray region is what we call the parent vessels, so the vessels from which that aneurysm would have developed. Now, fortunately for most people, aneurysms don't actually rupture. One can live with an aneurysm on their brain throughout their lives. But those unruptured aneurysms present quite a challenge for doctors. If an aneurysm is accidentally sighted during a routine scan for a different disease, the doctor then has to make a decision to say, should we treat the aneurysm, which actually may remain asymptomatic throughout the life of the individual. And that exposes the individual to unnecessary medical risk. 
However, similarly, the decision not to treat could later prove fatal if that aneurysm should rupture. So let's speak a bit about how those aneurysms are treated. In the past, surgeons used to open up the brain, get to the aneurysm, take a metal clip and put a clip around it. And that isolates the aneurysm from the parent vessel. These days, we have what we call endovascular techniques, which basically means that the clinician goes from within the veins. So typically a hole is made in the groin and then a camera with a catheter is advanced all the way up to the aneurysm until they can see it. And then they'll either fill it with metal coils as shown in the first example, thereby limiting the amount of blood flow that can go into the aneurysm and reducing the risk of rupture. A more recent technique is what we call flow diverters, which are tubular mesh-like structures with a very tightly woven mesh. And placing them there also dramatically reduces the amount of flow that goes into the aneurysm sac, again, reducing the risk of rupture. And typically what's observed is that after these treatments, the flow slows significantly within the aneurysm sac, thereby giving rise to a clot. And this can be a good thing or a bad thing. For some patients, the clot will completely fill the aneurysm sac, thereby providing a natural barrier that prevents any further flow from going into the aneurysm. In other patients, the aneurysm only half fills the sac, and what that means is the clotting reactions keep going and those risk further degrading the wall and therefore speeding up the time to rupture. And so one of the things that was then thought is what would be quite desirable is some kind of computational tool that could give the clinician an additional piece of information about if I were to select coils or if I were to select a flow diverter for this specific patient, what would that do? do in terms of the clotting outcome. And the reason we have to consider it on a per patient basis is as you can see in these three diagrams, aneurysms look quite different from patient to patient. The second thing to consider is that different people clot differently. So some people are hemophiliacs, they don't clot easily. Other people clot too much. And so a tool that can bring those two worlds together to give some kind of indication about what kind of clot might form would be hugely beneficial. And so we set out to do exactly that. And what would a computational patient specific tool look like? Well, if we go from left to right, it would have to be able to take in some kind of patient specific inputs. So the first thing that we'd need is some good quality images of the aneurysm, which can be obtained during routine medical scans. And then we'd also want some indication of how the person clots. Do they clot a lot? Do they clot too little? And typically, one can get that from standard clinical hospital tests. There's a whole host and plethora of tests that get carried out for clotting. However, our current model isn't able to directly interface with those existing tests, but we're hoping to get there at a stage. Once we have that information, we want to be able to build some kind of computational model shown in the second column. And so to do that, we would need to take our inputs and prepare them into a suitable format for whatever calculations we decide we need to do. And we also need to decide on the important equations that we need to solve for the specific problem we're looking at. In our case, those related to blood flow, as well as those related to biochemistry. We then get input outputs from our computational calculations. And so we get those results from the equations and based on that, we can calculate other variables that may not be directly solved by our system of equations. But we also get out the format as just a long file with a whole lot of numbers. So we then need to process that data into a format that makes that information understandable. And then finally, and we don't necessarily need to do this for every single model, but we need to ensure that our models actually replicate some kind of physical reality. One might say, well, of course, the models are derived from physical reality or the equations are derived from physical reality. And that is true. However, in our model, we bring together different systems of equations for which they may, no be, they may not be solutions out there. And so we need to design, even if it's simple experiments, to ensure that what we're modeling actually replicates physical reality. 
So to go into a bit more detail on each of those steps, what do we mean when we say we need to obtain a good geometry? The first thing that we do is we get some MRI or CT scans, which enable us to reconstruct the aneurysm. And if we look over here, we have an MRI scan from a patient, and you'll see in gray over here that there's some blood vessels illuminated, and the big circular blob shows the aneurysm region. And so we have specialized software where we can basically extract and pull out the aneurysm into some kind of virtual 3D shape on the right-hand side that we can work with in our models. And as you can see again, they look very different from patient to patient. So over here, we have the aneurysm bulges attached to the parent vessel, and in the different cases, they look quite different. Once we have those shapes to work with in a virtual space, we can then go ahead and begin to apply our methods. And we'll begin on the left, and I'll explain everything, and then we'll move across to the right. So the main method that we use to calculate our flow field is a technique known as computational fluid dynamics. And this technique is based on the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid flow, which I personally think are quite beautiful because they represent a range of flows with very wide variability. When we talk about fluids, we include both liquids and gases. So the Navier-Stokes equations are used to improve the design of airplane wings, for example, to make airplanes more efficient. And they also find applicability in our studies of fluid flow. Now, what's quite interesting is that these equations were written in the 1800s, but we didn't know the power or the potential for exploiting them until the advent of computing. And so with computing power, we can show for a wide range of applications that these equations hold in all of those instances. What do we get from solving the equations? We get velocity and pressure measurements. And you may wonder why the aneurysm suddenly looks like a net or a mesh. With the Navier-Stokes equations, there isn't an exact solution for those equations. But people have gone ahead and developed approximations of solutions for more simple shapes, like cubes and tetrahedra. When you work with an organic shape, like an aneurysm, there's definitely not going to be a solution for that. So what we do is we take our aneurysm geometry and chop it up into millions of little regularized shapes and we can solve the equations on each of those individual shapes. Now, obviously, the more sh little shapes you cut it up into, the greater the computational cost. So the calculation we're always making is one of balancing accuracy against how long the calculation is going to take. The other thing that our fluid flow module allows us to do is it allows us to account for the transport of the different chemical proteins that we said are present in the blood. So we include those in the flow field, and as the flow travels, enters through the parent vessel and moves through the parent vessel and the aneurysms, we also have simulated proteins moving with it. And if they're proteins, we have to be able to account for the fact that they're going to react with each other. So we move over to the right-hand side of the diagram. And that's where our biochemical modeling comes into place. The fact that we have all these blood proteins that contribute to the clotting process, as shown in the diagram, means that they are able to recognize each other and react with each other when they meet each other. Now, you'll see that these are named by a whole range of different alphabetical names. Those are literally factor 10, factor 5, and that's how the coagulation proteins are actually called. And some very impressive biochemists have done the work of figuring out how they react with each other, which I won't go into here. But all this to say that we are able to, in our model, account for the reactions between those different coagulation species by giving them rules to say, when you meet this one, go ahead and do this. And what that allows us to do is to account for the changes in the concentration and amount of the different proteins. Because as they react, some will form, some will be consumed, and others will form new proteins. And so what we do is as certain proteins exceed a specific concentration, we suddenly say in a clot, 
once we exceed this kind of concentration, that would typically turn from normal flowing blood into clotted blood. So what we do is once that happens in our biochemistry, we take it back to the fluid module and say, change the properties of the fluid. Change that little section to be gel-like so that any proteins moving in there suddenly experience resistance, spend more time with each other, and can further react together. All of this to basically say that our models are able to account both for the fluid component and the biochemical component, and those components have an impact on each other. So what kind of results can we get from that model? If we take a case here of the aneurysm that we've seen, you'll see that we have the first row and the second row, and that those two rows look quite different, even though the results are for the same variables. In the first row, what we did is we simulated a case where we didn't have any treatment devices placed in the aneurysm or in the parent vessel. Then in the second row, we simulated a case where we had a flow diverter, that mesh-like structure in place, to see what would then happen in terms of our fluid mechanics and both the biochemistry when we suddenly had something in place. And so the first column shows us the flow. So if we follow these lines, we have flow coming in at this end and exiting at the other end. And so what these squiggly lines tell us is if there were a particle that to, were to be introduced into the flow, what is the path that it would follow as it travels through the parent vessel and the aneurysm? And what you'll see is where we have no device, the particle would enter, go into the aneurysm sac in some kind of recirculation, and then exit out the other end. The moment we put a flow diverter in place, you'll remember I said that most of the treatments are designed to reduce the amount of flow going into the aneurysm. We similarly have flow entering, however it's prevented from entering the aneurysm because the flow diverter reduces the amount of flow going into the aneurysm. And so we can capture that with our model. The colors shown on the actual wall of the aneurysm relate to a variable called strain rate with blue being a very low strain rate and pink being a very high strain rate. The significance of this variable is it allows us to calculate something that we call shear force. And in the body, cells are very sensitive to shear forces. So when a fluid flows through the body, the cells sense that fluid through the shear force. And so our model doesn't directly account for the presence of cells at all, but if we wanted to combine it with cells, what we'd be able to do is to say, we can calculate the shear force and tell it at very specific points what shear force those cells would experience. The second thing we're able to obtain from our model is the concentration of the proteins that are reacting with each other. And in this case, we've just chosen one protein thrombin that would form as a result of all the reactions taking place. In the case where there isn't a device, again, blue is very low thrombin amount and pink is very high thrombin amount. You'll see that when there isn't a device, the flow is so active that there isn't a chance for the chemical protein to gather. However, once we've put a flow diverter in place and slowed the flow down, there's sufficient time for the reactions to happen between the different proteins. And so we have the formation of thrombin on the wall of the aneurysm compared to a case where there isn't a device. Finally, we can also see where the clot would be within our actual geometry. So in the case where there isn't a device, you'll see there's small red dots on the wall of the aneurysm. Those indicate that a very small clot forms, but nothing significant. If we go to the case with a flow diverter, you'll see quite a large continuous clot that forms in that geometry. And so we know that our model can account for all of those differences and give rise to some kind of clot. But how do we know that this is all true? How can we be certain that this virtual world and these computational models that we've built actually replicate physical reality? Well, we do base them on equations that are based on actual physical um, descriptions of nature. But we still need to go and develop some kind of experiment, however simple it may be, 
to enable us to verify that we're, what we are modeling does actually touch base with physical reality. So what we then went ahead and did is I was fortunate at this point in my work to meet some excellent experimental partners who had far more experience in experimentation than myself. And so they could assist me with the process of developing those experiments and thinking about how we may go about that process. And so this work in particular that I'll show in the next three slides was done in collaboration with Wei Hua Ho, Zara Sheikh, and a student of ours, Jean-Marc Chimanga, who were based at UNISA, now Vitz. And what we first thought that we should do is mm. rather than working with a realistic geometry, we should work with an idealized geometry to begin with. And the reason for that is we didn't want to optimize our model and build everything around a single patient's case, which may not actually hold in a whole host of other patients' cases. So we thought, how can we go about idealizing the parent vessel and the aneurysm? And fortunately, there were quite a lot of people who'd already gone about doing the work of idealization in literature. And so what we first have in the first block is a picture of what that idealized geometry looks like. You'll see that we have a half bent cylinder, which represents the parent artery, and the sphere at the top represents the aneurysm. The second important thing to note is the scale. So this is about 49.5 millimeters across, which is about four centimeters in size and 33.2 millimeters in height, so about three centimeters in size. Fortunately for the methods that we were working with, this was large enough for us to be able to see and conduct our experiments. However, there's a concept in fluid mechanics called dynamic similarity, where in cases where you may not actually have the right size based on the problem that you're looking at, you can scale the model up and down, provided that you keep the properties of the fluid more or, or the ratios of the properties of the fluid more or less the same. So one would take into account the density of the fluid, the speed with which it's flowing, the size of the artery that it's moving through, as well as how sticky the fluid is. And provided that one can keep that ratio together, then one is able to move between different sizes. Fortunately, that wasn't a problem for us, but it's something that we need to consider later when we work with real human blood. So we then took our idealized geometry and 3D printed it using a normal desktop 3D printer, which you can see in the next picture over here. And we 3D printed it with a clear resin so that we could see what was going on inside. With our experiments, we wanted to be able to see the fluid flowing. We wanted to be able to see the clot growing. And so it was important to have it be transparent. The flow system was quite simple. We had a pump which drove flow into the geometry and an outlet from which flow could exit. The big problem that we have was that we would develop a lot of bubbles. So we'd spend a lot of time trying to think through how to get rid of trapped bubbles. But in the end, fortunately, it's a setup that worked. So then what do we use this flow system to do? The first thing that we wanted to be able to do was to quantify our flow field so that we could compare the flow results to the ones that we were calculating with our computational model. And so we used a technique called particle image velocimetry, which simply put means a technique for measuring the velocity of particles using images. And so what we would do is we would have our pump switched on and we would drive flow through. We would put a whole lot of little particles, lots of tiny microparticles into the flow we shine a laser light onto the particles so that we could see them. And then we take lots of pictures with a high speed camera with a very short amount of time between each photograph. And because we know that the amount of time between each photograph and because the time is so small, we can actually follow the path of those little particles moving through our flow field. And with a bit of calculating, that enables us to actually calculate the quantities of how fast those particles are moving. And you'll see that we have a whole lot of arrows in our geometry, which shows the direction of the flow. So if we then look at some kind of colored map of the flow field, this image on the left 
shows the velocity map of those particles moving through. And what we have again is blue is very low flow and yellow is high flow. So we see that the lowest flow happened in the aneurysm and higher flow happened in the parent vessel. And this specific picture was produced by Jean-Marc Chimanga. Struen Hume, a master student in my group, then went ahead and ran the same computational experiment using our setup so that we could see if these two results would match up. And fortunately for us, they did match up. And so what we can see in the flow computation is, again, we have low flow in the aneurysm and high flow in the parent vessel. The colors don't match up because we couldn't get this color bar to work exactly, um, to look exactly like the one from the experiment. However, the maximum and minimum values are more or less equal. There are some discrepancies because when one runs physical experiments, the sort of accuracy that one gets at the edges of the geometry may not be great, but we did calculate the error arising from the comparison of the experimental and the computational results and were adequately satisfied. So we then were able to say, okay, in terms of the flow field, our computational model is more or less ac accurately presenting some kind of physical reality. The next challenge that we had was to figure out how to actually grow a clot in that flow field. And so Rethia came to the rescue very early on. We went to her lab and said, Rethia, how do we grow clots? And she sat down with us and said, you mix this and this and that, and this is how a clot forms. Now we then had to take that and say, how do we put it in a flow system <laughs> and actually get the clot to grow? So again, we had our clot growth set up we had a pump at the one end that pumped in fibrinogen, which is one of the key clotting proteins that is required for a clot to form. We then had another pump at the top that pumped in a different protein. And when these two proteins react, they form a clot. Again, the challenge of bubbles. However, eventually we were able to get some good results and you can see those on the right hand side. And what this is, is a, is a series of photographs taken over four minutes, so zero to 240 seconds, where we could track the growth of the clot, and one can see it growing in real time in the flow. Now, we were quite lucky with this experiment, actually, because typically fibrinogen and thrombin are clear fluids. So even when the clot forms, it's clear, and you can't actually see it. So for most of our experiments, we had clear clots, and we'd have to inject something at the end to be able to see that the sizes remain constant. However, in this one specific run, the clot turned a slightly murky color, it turned white. And so we could see it as it was growing. And so now one of the things that we're working really hard on is figuring out how we may be able to use fluorescent proteins that'll enable us to see the growing clot throughout the entire flow period. The other thing we're working on is figuring out how to get the growing clot and the flow field captured at the same time. And that's going to be an interesting challenge because typically the measurements for the flow field happen in the dark, whereas the measurements for the clot happen in a light room. But perhaps with some kind of fluorescence, we'll figure out how to bring those two things together. So this is more or less where we've gotten to now in the process of actually making sure that our clots match up with these results over here, things are looking good, but there are a few things to tweak to ensure that those two things match up entirely. Of course, these are very reduced experiments. They don't include the entire complexity of the human body. They don't include the endothelium. They don't include the cells. We just have two of the clotting proteins interacting with each other to form a clot. And we're aware of that we can account for a bit more complexity in our computational models. But this is a starting point of being able to couple the flow with the biochemistry. And at least we know that we are replicating some kind of physical reality. We have gone on from brain aneurysms to also look at other kinds of vascular diseases. So a close relative of the brain aneurysm is the abdominal aortic aneurysm which is similarly a weakening of the blood vessel wall, but that happens on a vessel coming directly out of the heart. And so we were interested in seeing how thrombosis might look in that case. The specific simulation and beautiful picture was produced by a student, Mark Taylor. 
And what you can see is the yellow region indicates the clot, and all the little arrows and circular parts actually show the fluid field and its complexity. What's interesting about thrombosis in a vessel coming directly out of the heart is that the flow field there is very heavily influenced by the pulse of the heart. So that flow field is very heavily pulsatile, and you see dramatic changes in the flow as a result of the heart's pumping action. So that gives rise to quite different clotting patterns when we compare those to patterns on the brain. Another vascular disease that we've taken a look at is deep vein thrombosis, which is another completely different flow field because the veins, unlike the arteries, carry blood back to the heart. Deoxygenated blood that needs to go and be refreshed in the heart is carried back to the heart. And so by that stage, you've completely let, let, um, lost that pulsing effect of the heart, and the flow is actually quite steady and undramatic. However, in the veins, you do have valves opening and closing to prevent flow from going back down. And so you get a bit of that pulsing effect. And Kudus Jimotaiwo, one of our students, have been working very hard to figure out how to model that impact of the opening and closing of the valves and how that changes the flow. So this is in a large part, or this is in summary, the computational and experimental frameworks that we've been working on in an effort to couple the blood flow with the biochemistry in the study of clotting. One of the things that we really, really wanted to do when we were working on our experimental techniques was to work with human blood. But that, that introduces a whole host of completely different challenges. One of them being that you can't get very large samples of blood from humans, thankfully, because that would kill them. <laughs> and so we need to then consider a completely different system of being able to study the flow because we're working with such small quantities. To give you an example of the experiment that I showed you earlier with the fibrinogen and the thrombin, at v if we're working with a very high speed flow, we can go through about a liter of fibrinogen in an experiment, which we wouldn't be able to do with human blood. A normal test where blood gets collected in a hospital takes about between one and two milliliters of blood. So that's all we have to work with. And so we figured out how we were going to work with human blood in our system, and then COVID came along, which it represented or gave us a unique opportunity to test drive how well that system would work. And in this aspect of the work, I was really fortunate to work with Risia Pretorius and her team, Ray Choblar and Chantal Fenter, who were interested as well in looking at how COVID goes about changing the coagulation system in the body. So to give a very, very basic explanation of COVID as neither a vaccinologist or a virologist, what I'll begin by saying is that this image that we have over here is a simplified diagram of the virus with the spike protein sitting on the surface. Viruses tend to have spike proteins and what the spike protein does is it enables the virus to enter the host cells, hijack them, replicate itself, and cause disease in the body. Now, what has already been identified and quite well studied in terms of COVID is that in order for that virus to be able to enter the cells, there needs to be a site or a protein or a binding site or a receptor that the virus can attach onto on the host cells. And in the case of COVID-19, that has been identified largely as ACE2. And what we know about ACE2 is that there's an abundance of ACE2 receptors on the endothelial cells. And as we said in the very beginning of the talk, the endothelium is the layer that separates the flowing blood from the rest of the subendothelial layers in the blood vessel. And so any damage to that endothelium basically means that clotting can begin to occur. And what has been noticed is that COVID attaches quite nicely to the endothelial cells, causing dysfunction and dysregulation. What Risia and her team were particularly interested in was, okay, so we know that COVID interacts with the endothelial cells and other cells in the body in order to give rise to some of the clotting dysregulation that we see. 
But what happens when COVID actually encounters blood? What happens when COVID encounters some of those clotting proteins that give rise to clot formation? And so that was the angle with which we carried out the study in the last few months of last year. And in order to be able to do that, blood samples were taken and everything was removed from those blood samples with the exception of the clotting proteins that participate in the clotting process. Again, this is a simplification of a very complex system. When COVID enters the body, there are a whole host of mechanisms that come into play and go into dysfunction, but we wanted to particularly fo focus on the pro protein clots or the clotting proteins and see what would happen there. So what did our new system have to look like? Rather than working with the large geometries that we typically worked with, we suddenly had to work with this device known as a microfluidic chip. And I'm not sure if you can see from the diagram, but you'll notice that there's some lines going across and one of the lines is circled in red. That line is the actual geometry or the gap through which the blood flows. And it's about the size of a human hair. So really, really, really very narrow and very small. And so in order to be able to see what's going on there, we need to place it under a microscope. Fortunately, the vessels that are really heavily affected by COVID in the lung tend to be on that order of magnitude in terms of scale. Actually, these channels that we use are quite a bit larger than the vessels that are in the lung that are typically affected by COVID clots, but we were in the right order of magnitude and could use that earlier concept of dynamic similarity and matching to see how we may get those two systems to add up. Again, we had some kind of inlet with a pump where we could drive the flow through our geometry and it would come out the other end. So when we had the system at the end, this is our chip and this is the specific channel. We'd connect it to the microfluidic pump, place it under a microscope, and then we could hopefully see growing clots. And what are the kinds of results that we were able to obtain? So if we take what we call platelet poor plasma, because we've removed all the other parts and just left behind the clotting proteins, and grow a clot using healthy person's plasma, what you'll see in both of these images, which are taken from two different individuals, is that actually the clot is pretty inconsequential. It looks like nothing's going on. And these videos were taken at the end of five minutes for all of these. If we then move across to the case of COVID-19, you get pretty significant clots that form in the same amount of time period for both the patients that we took a look at. And the other interesting thing to note is that these clots grew quite significantly into the channel, thereby reducing the space for flow to go through and limiting the amount of blood flow that could happen once the clot had formed. The other thing that we then thought is, okay, if one takes healthy blood and adds just the spike protein to it, because the spike protein is the one that negotiates entry into the cells, what would happen? And the reason for, for this question was that spike protein wasn't only, didn't only seem to be found in cells where entry had been negotiated, but it had been found in other parts of the body as well. So we wanted to know if we actually isolated the spike protein and added it to healthy blood, would we see any changes in the clotting process? And in actual fact, we did. What was interesting about these clots is that they sat somewhere in between healthy and COVID clots. They didn't quite fill their aneurysm, um, the channel entirely, but what they did is that one could see that sense of disorganized clot formation. The three main things we observed from these experiments, at this stage, we haven't been able to actually compute the flow field exactly. We've just gotten microparticles and I'm hoping we'll be able to introduce those so that we can also get a sense of the speeds of flow. While one can estimate that based on the simplicity of the channel, one of the challenges is that the viscosity or the stickiness of the blood changes quite dramatically in COVID. And so one can't entirely trust that one viscosity measurement will hold constant all the way across. So the first interesting thing we observed in comparing these three cases was the nature of the clot, just the sheer size of it, the organization, and how much space it filled up. 
The second thing we observed was the rate of clot formation. So in the healthy case, these clots took a really long time to form. After five minutes, there wasn't much to write home about. The COVID clot, on the other hand, formed within the first 90 seconds. The reaction had happened, and it looked like a bit of an explosion site. One of the most interesting observations, however, happened at washing up time, because we wanted to be able to reuse the channels. And we thought, OK, we'll just introduce water at really high speed and get rid of the clots, and then hopefully we can wash them out and then run the next experiment. So that worked for the healthy case, and then that worked for the healthy plus spike. But when it came to COVID clots, they held on for dear life. We couldn't actually remove them from the channel. And that in a plastic channel, where you don't even have the subendothelial layers to attach to, which help the clot hold on. This was purely in a plastic medium, and we couldn't get rid of the clots. And so Risi and her team ran some additional studies, and what they actually saw is that part of the challenge with COVID clots is the issue of being able to dissolve them. And a couple of studies have corrobor corroborated that, and so people are trying to look at the different kinds of drugs that may then actually prove useful for that dissolution process. So this is where we are with the COVID work. Next up, we'll be looking at some of the variants and seeing if they produce anything interesting in um, partnership with Marae, who's now doing her master's project. And we're hoping this will open up a whole host of other opportunities. So that's the end of my talk. It takes a village to do good science. So I wish to thank all my collaborators and students and funders um, who've been absolutely necessary for this work to take place. A very big thank you to STIAS um, for the home that they've been, for the space that they've been, for this wonderful Isolam fellowship, which has really allowed me to develop um, as a scientist and as an academic. And thank you to everyone um, on Teams, to family, friends, colleagues, students who have made their way here. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Maleboho. I think another round of uh, applause to the presentation. <laughs> May I ask Christoph to make some comments and then um, run the first Thank you so much, uh, Maleboho. Thank you, Edward. I hope everyone can see and hear me well. Yes. Uh, Again, Maleboko, thank you so much for such an informative talk. That was really accessible, uh, and you have some great imagery there to have kept us spellbound. That was fantastic. Um, let me uh, just say good afternoon to everyone. My name is Christoph Poe. I'm the program manager at STIAS. It's wonderful to see on the name list so many uh, of our fellows' names uh, who have joined us online. Welcome, thank you all. Likewise, our colleagues at Stellenbosch Universities and at several other universities uh, in the country and elsewhere, and to all the friends and uh, followers of STIAS, it's wonderful to have uh, this opportunity. So Edward and I will moderate the Q&A session jointly. I will look after our online audience uh, while he serves the physical audience at CS, We will take two questions at a time, uh, rotating between the CS audience in the room there and, and the online audience. And we will continue this back and forth uh, until uh, our time is up, which would, would be in at about quarter past the hour. So just a few requests before we start. Please introduce yourself when you address a question. If you're online, please switch on your camera so that we may see you and remember to unmute yourself. Um, please keep the questions concise. The online audience may use the little raise hand function and then I'll just pick up your, your um, hands in the order that they came up. Uh, you may address the question and, and, uh, and then Mariboho will respond to two questions at a time. For the physical audience, please be mindful that the online audience will hear you best if you stand up uh, and if you speak clearly so that the microphone that Nalmarie, I believe, has now moved to the center of the room uh, picks up the sound. 
it helps if you have earphones at hand to put them on, uh, then you'll hear the, the, um, the physical audience members better when they speak. Uh, so please do use them if you have those at hand. So with that, let me uh, suggest that we start with any questions from the room in the audience at STIAS. And uh, for that, therefore, I'll hand back to Edward. Shall we have the first um, questions, reactions, comments? Yanni? So I'm Yanni Hoffmeyer. I'm part of the STIAS Fellowship and Program Committee, and I'm Professor of Biochemistry at Stellenbosch. Of course, I'm interested in the biochemistry. So it's a, maybe a bit of a technical question, but you always have the problem when you have a model that in your case describes fluid dynamics and then another model which describes a network of biochemical reactions. We have the same problem, we model what happens inside the cell, but then we also want to connect it to what happens in the whole body. How, did, how does your model work? How do, you, how do you connect it to, is it one big model or do they sort of talk to each other? Um, so basically what we've done is that we've used the fluid dynamics module or the fluid dynamics tool or software suite as the base sort of suite that we then incorporate a whole lot of other features into it. And so what one can do is one can write specialized code to enable the calculation of the biochemical updates within that framework. Because in essence, what we do is we consider various steps at various points in time, both in terms of the fluid and the biochemistry. So typically what the model will do is we'll initialize the entire model and say we have this concentration of biochemical proteins and this speed of flow. And so the flow model will begin. And those proteins then at the same time begin reacting with each other. And at the end of every single time step, we update both. So we will say the biochemical proteins as a result of the velocity of the fluid field have traveled this far but then they have also reacted this much. It's actually specific terms in the equations. So in terms of the flow equation, there's a transport equation, which accounts for the fact that the proteins are being carried by the mainstream flow. When they're close to each other, they're diffusing, and then also that they're reacting. And so we can compute that number or that change in concentration and input it back into the flow through a source term. What then happens to the flow is that once the concentration of the molecule gets to a certain number, we change the porosity of that specific flow field to almost simulate the effect that you have from platelets. Because what the proteins see is a whole construction of little platelets like a maze that they have to move through. So suddenly they encounter that kind of porosity arising from the flow field. And so it's something that we do at the end of every single time step within our computation, which is also what adds significant time to our um, computation is that we want to compute both at every time step and not take a segregated approach where we say, well, first fully run the flow field and then fully run the biochemistry because the two are so interlinked. Thanks. Thanks. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Second question, comment? Um, or should I hand over to Dr. Yeah, thank you very much. Fascinating. Uh, I was just wondering about also biochemistry uh, and the complexity of the system uh, in two ways. Uh, first, the factors in the clotting uh, pathways also interact with other pathways, the spongiogenesis, arteriogenesis, wound healing, uh, flow control. And uh, Factors from other pathways interact with this molecules. Uh, and also the wiring, the, the local wiring of the pipe, uh, because in the brain you have the collaterals. And so how uh, you can simulate the interactions, maybe through a balance that uh, brings things to a threshold and you assure you are not in a situation of uh, triggering another pathway. Uh, and how do you choose the architecture uh, 
And yeah, just one more thing. If you have thought about using toxins and fans, because they modulate it in a cyclic way, just, yeah, th there is also this thing. Because you assume the molecules are constant, right? Um, well, they change the concentration of the user bus and interact. But the system is not fed with more. Um, we do have them coming in a bit okay. at the beginning. That's right. So you simulate that physiology. Yeah. Um, those are very good questions about how do we actually make the modeling decisions, how do we decide what to incorporate, what not to incorporate, and the fact that this coagulation system is embedded in a much deeper, much broader system accounts for inflammation and a whole host of other features that come into play. So I think that um, in as much as the biochemistry exists to be able to couple those kinds of things, we'd be able to add that over here. Typically with something like aneurysms, people come at it from different angles. So even the fact that the vessel wall is changing over time, for example, when the aneurysm forms, you have degradation of elastin, deposition of collagen, and that's constantly mediated by the flow field. So that's something that can definitely be incorporated as well. Um, it's a question of what do we actually want to answer with this specific model, and I think that's how we decide to draw the boundaries. So the starting point of this particular work was to say, can we get a tool that will give clinicians some kind of insight into the clotting process? within a relatively quick amount of time. Because the more systems we incorporate into our modeling platform, the greater the amount of time needed to solve it. Now, I wouldn't take this model and say we're going to model a process that plays out over 12 months. Because suddenly all of those things become hugely important. And I'm not actually sure that our system of equations would then be sufficient for getting to those things. We may need a completely different modeling framework, perhaps a complexity approach to be able to capture what happens over a longer time period. But we're looking at a four minute time period where the clinician places a flow diameter during an operation, a clot forms, and that's the sort of window that we're looking at. But to say that there is work where people are figuring out how to link. In terms of the venoms and toxins, those will also be able to be incorporated. And what I'm interested in venoms particularly is the anticoagulant effect. So that's something that we've wrestled quite a bit with to say for a specific patient, how can we include the impact of a doctor giving the patient drugs? Because that also then changes how the patient clots. And so we've played around with the different biochemical models that purely describe clotting. The most sophisticated one that we used had 27 reactions and 42 constants. But of course, there's no way that you can measure that for a single patient coming into a clinic. We then went completely the other way and said, can we just get a thrombin measurement over time of how this person clots? And with those kinds of measurements, you can actually also incorporate the effect of anticoagulant drugs because the pathways for those and how they interact with the human body is actually quite complicated um, because as you pointed out, the environment or the cells interact and make choices. It's not necessarily a deterministic process. Thank you. Please start from Algeria. Please start from there you go. Okay, so uh, we have um, a first question from Brian, Brian Arthur. Welcome, Brian. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Brian Arthur, I'm a STIAS fellow. Um, and my question is that uh, you're talking here about an equation based system. Maybe this is a little bit technical. Uh, using Navier Stokes equations and what looked to me like some sort of finite element type of analysis. Um, but you, a moment ago, you mentioned complexity, and uh, you and I had talked that this might lead to an agent-based uh, approach, which is more general. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought more about that, and if you've anything 
more to say about agent-based methods rather than uh, equation-based methods. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Um, and I think my answer to you is going to be similar to my answer to Marcella. I think the kind of model that we have here is most beneficial when we're considering very particular points in time. I think what would be quite nice in terms of an agent-based model would be to take the result of this four minutes as the input condition for a much longer time period. Because actually the plotting outcome in aneurysm, as an example, plays out over a period of 12 to 18 months. And a whole different system of cells and interactions move in to that zone where the plot originally formed. And so what would be quite nice is to take this four minute time period, take that as a starting point, and perhaps introduce an agent-based model, let it run and see what plays out based on that. So that's still my thinking is that from going from the four minutes to 12 or 18 months, a complexity model based on agent-based modeling would be more accurate for this sort of thing. I've also thought about it in terms of other work that we do that wasn't shown here today, also based on fluid dynamics, working on children with heart disease and how their flow, um, how the flow happens in their repaired aortas following operations. Because there, again, we're looking at a long, a much, much longer time period, I think a complexity model would be more appropriate there. So to crystallize that, my thinking is that if we're looking at a very short time frame where we can sort of make use of more reduced models, this system of modeling that we're using is still appropriate. But if we take much, much longer periods of time and therefore bigger time steps, perhaps agent-based models may be of benefit to us. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands at this stage. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, um, Malibojo. So uh, we can go back, Edward, to any further questions in the in the room there. Thank you, uh, This is uh, just fascinating to give people what the, the other said. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I have no idea uh, about these, 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 these issues. Um, and I have been really fascinated by uh, two, two words. It's a simplification, modelization. And this is really what you're doing. In the, taking that seriously, you have uh, in your model what you call uh, the mechanical component, and you have also these uh, biomechanical uh, uh, component. And these are uh, these are really essential. And what do you do with a potential five patient like myself? What do you do with our condition, this subjective uh, condition of a patient? Does does uh, does it have any role? in this flow, in this uh, mechanic, in this system, please. Okay. Thank you. So sorry, just to clarify, I, I, I missed the one part. You said, what do we do with which kind of patient? Uh, if a standard patient like myself, for example, who is sick, right. and what do you what do, you do uh, of this uh, condition of a patient? Is the patient who is sick or a patient who, uh, a patient who is very sick and sex, et cetera, et cetera. So, what do you do with these uh, these uh, conditions of the patient? Does it does it have uh, any role to, to to play? That's an excellent question. Um, so, in, at the end of the day, what do our models actually bring? What is the value add of that modeling process? Um, I think one of the things that I've come to realize is that obviously we have all these tools and techniques which enable us insight into these different conditions. But the thing that's absolutely key and crucial in these processes is the doctors and the clinicians that we work with. Is this information of use to them? And so even the starting point of this aneurysm work was a question that came out of the clinical field to say, look, we go in for routine scans, medical imaging technology has advanced so far 
that someone may come in with a heart condition and then we see an aneurysm. And so then what do we do? Do we just leave the aneurysm alone? And typically, they may just schedule a series of routine scans and say, come back. But there's some aneurysms that sit on the border. And so the doctor said, is there some way that we can develop a system that will allow us to model that and allow us to have insight into that? To get these models into the actual clinical space is a long road, is a very long road. I think when that question was asked, People thought, oh, it will be a matter of one or two years, we'll develop the models, we'll have the technology, and then we'll be able to use it. But what we're fast learning is that it takes a much, much longer time period, because even before you can get to the stage of developing the model, you first just have to develop a common language with the doctors to say, what are we actually looking for? What is of benefit? So one of the projects that is a much shorter time project than this one on aneurysms, for example, which has been developed for children with heart disease. We literally go and sit in on the doctor's meetings and sit through the cases and they'll say, here's this case, here's the next case. Can you tell us what the fluid field looks like? And if we operate and open it up this far versus that far, what is going to happen in terms of the long term of how that fluid field looks? And in the case of children, the doctors really appreciate that information for a couple of reasons. The patient is going to continue growing. So you operate on someone at age two, you want to have a sense when they're eight years old and their aorta is slightly bigger, if we widen it this much or put a stent in place, how will that look when they're eight? Because you want to try and minimize the number of times that you go in and treat the patient. But also the other question that then arises is if the patient lives very far away and can't easily access the hospital, we want to treat them once and ensure that that will hold for a long time. The patient probably wouldn't see any of that work. It had happened in the background when the doctors are discussing the cases. We might be sitting there and say, okay, we can run a simulation for you. But the fact that we're now at this point where we can even run these clinical simulations to help the doctor make an additional decision has taken many, many, many years of figuring out how to make this technology work. Thank you. I think one of the things is that we're, we're also noticing that it's taking much longer even to work with the vaccines that we have. <laughs> so, um, so, Elena, please. Okay, thanks, my for the presentation. My question is very simple, but I'm just interested to know. You mentioned that you look at when uh, um, those grow too little or too much, yeah? Isn't that an instance where there's no clothing at all in, in person? And would you say that those who are, who clothe a lot are more likely to struggle with COVID-19 than those who don't? Since you're saying, that, that, that you mentioned about the spike, thing, the racing on the red globe, on the blue globe that you put there, it, it, it's much easier to, to enter when the, 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 the whether they are clothes or not. But now I'm curious to know now, if there's much clothing in the blood, is COVID-19, is someone likely to struggle more when they have COVID-19? Yeah. yeah, thank you for that question. So when I talk about people clotting too much or clotting too little, the situations that also give a rise to you being able to even see that a person clots too much or too little uh, may be very specific. So when we say, for example, that someone clots too much, it can be any range of those different factors that go out of function. And so some studies have already been done to show that some people may be more at risk for developing COVID. For example, people with what's called from Villebrandt's disease um, may run into problems with clotting and COVID, but I don't think it's quite that simple to be able to make a link to say, well, this person generally clots too much and clots too little, therefore this is how it all translates to COVID. It depends which pathway specifically has been altered. Because of course, the other thing about the COVID clotting is in the study with Rizia and her team, we were just looking purely at the clotting protein but the body just has a much wider system. There's the endothelium, there's a whole host of other cells interacting. So that also then complicates who is susceptible to the <laughs> Another question? Uh, 
Let me ask a layman's question because uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. It's brilliant. Uh, my father died from a stroke. And so I've been monitored by my doctors for many years with all these things in mind. I know a stroke and an aneurysm are not the same. Uh, one is like a vein tears, the other is a clot. But both are also connected to blood flows. I know you're not a medical doctor, but you seem to be very informed. Could you speak to the role of blood flow in these two different contexts uh, in ways that I, for example, can I'll leave with some information as to how I deal with myself. So we get two different kinds of stroke. One is called the hemorrhagic stroke, which basically happens as you describe when the vessel tears and there's bleeding on the brain, which then eventually causes death if that bleed isn't stopped in time or if the clot doesn't fall in a way that can stop the bleed. The other type of stroke that we get is what we call an ischemic stroke, and that's a stroke arising from there being a clot. So that kind of clot that you saw in the aneurysm may develop not in the bulge, but in the parent vessel itself. Because I don't, I don't know if you remember one of the first images that I showed you of the blood vessels. They're not straight in shape. They have twists and bends. So in some of those regions, the flow is sufficiently slow, such that a clot could develop and build up. And so first it depends which kind of stroke one is at risk of. One, it could either be the stroke that results from a cut or bleeding that can't be stopped, or the one that results from flow being stopped. Because once you develop the clot, you may actually close up that parent vessel, block any flow from traveling down, or from flowing past the clot, and then starve portions of the brain of oxygen. And both strokes tend to do that. So that's the actual impact of blood flow in strokes. Is in the one you just completely lose blood, in the other you have a blockage of blood, which then um, prevents the transportation of oxygen and nutrients. Um, and I'd probably say, I mean, I'm glad that you're on some kind of routine observation <laughs> so that your doctor's keeping track of it. Um, but yeah, that's the that's sort of flow impact on strokes. In a quick follow-up, I was struck by your comment that in terms of a, a blood clot, that often nothing might happen. And, and doctors have to then weigh when through some kind of scan they see it, whether to intervene or not to intervene. Uh, and I was struck by that because then it looks like Maybe in several instances, maybe nothing done might be the best thing. Yeah. And I, I was wondering whether you would speak to that a little bit. Okay. So in some instances, there are actually risk factors for clots. It just so happens when I was talking about clotting and aneurysm specifically, um, that I didn't talk about the risks of people who are likely to develop an aneurysm. But with some kinds of clots, what we know is that high levels of cholesterol circulation and lipids in the body already contribute to a less than optimal circulatory system. Similarly, if we think about people with hypertension, in the case of aneurysms, it's typically people with polycystic kidney disease who are likely to develop aneurysms. So they're people who are at risk. But to your comment about doing nothing, that's sometimes actually the point of observation, is that actually, with aneurysms, for example, doctors go, we don't necessarily want to treat every aneurysm because that exposes the patient to unnecessary risk if it never ruptures. So perhaps actually just observing it over time and if it never dramatically changes in size or does anything particularly spectacular, then we leave it as is. Thank you. That, of course, depends that the doctors don't tell you that there's something going on. They are actually the brothers. So, Crystal. Yeah, let's, thank you, Edward. Let's go online. We have a question from Tamar. 
Hi, thank you so much. I'm awe-inspiring, really, the work that you're doing. And I'm emboldened by Emmanuel's question to ask another um, idiot question from a lay person. And um, I, I don't know about others, but I was kind of terrified by the tenacity of that COVID clot that stuck to that wall and wouldn't dissolve. And it seemed so intractable. And, and so I just wanted to understand in terms of what the implications of this um, are for therapies that are being explored now in relation to COVID. So, you know, obviously the idiot response is blood thinners and all sorts of other things, but maybe they don't work with COVID. So how is your work, um, uh, you know, on the tenacity of these COVID clots feeding into potential um, therapies to deal with COVID? what might be able to dislodge this clot quite simply. I think there's a range of different um, anti-clotting drugs, if we might want to call them that. Aspirin, for example, is a drug that targets the platelets. So it stops the platelets from being able to gather. And there are actually a number of studies that have shown that in co-patients with COVID, if you administer some aspirin to them, the chances are very big, intense clot that eventually kill people forming is somewhat reduced. So I've seen some studies doing that. So basically, once the people are admitted into hospital, they will be put on some kind of antiplatelet drug like aspirin. Then you get a class of um, drugs that target the actual proteins themselves. So that target the factor 10, factor 5, different parts of that network. And those are your heparins and warfarins. And similarly, there's studies being done to see how those anticoagulant drugs work. Then you get a third class of drugs called thrombolytics or clot busting drugs. And they're typically deployed when you have clots like this that you need to dissolve. So now the patient is already quite advanced and you need to find a way to dissolve that clot and actually break it off. And so most of those clot busting drugs contain plasminogen, which is something that's also present in the body that degrades and breaks down the clots. So those large clinical trials are trying to figure out how we may be able to leverage um, the plasminogen type drugs or the plasminogen based drugs to be able to dissolve the clots. In terms of our work directly, we'll probably be seeing how to incorporate those molecules into our flow field to see which ones are effective for the clot dissolution. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you, Malibu. So uh, I don't see any hands uh, right at the moment uh, online. Let me encourage our online audience, please, to uh, to uh, pose any questions and comments that you have. In the meantime, we'll go back. So just remember to use the raise hand function if you want to do so. Um, uh, I do see someone's hand. I don't know whether that's a <laughs> request for a, for a, for a comment. If if you did want to ask a question, you can also just unmute yourself and and say something. Then we'll know. Um, in the meantime, uh, let's go back to the to the audience uh, at CS, Edward. So any comments, questions, or anything? I just wanted to make a small remark on, on the last question. I said, if you were Donald Trump, you would just say, well, inject something. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. <laughs> Thank you. That's right, yes. So um, uh, a question from um, uh, someone named Happy Sitole. Please go ahead, Happy. Uh, th thank you, and um, uh, Malaboha, thank you very much for the very, um, I would say, insightful talk that you have given. Um, this is not a question, but more of a comment. I think uh, what is uh, exemplary out of this study is uh, the linkages between experiment, modeling, and simulation. Um, and the scaling. So I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the work that you are doing and, and uh, uh, the examples that you have given that uh, we can see how the interdisciplinary 
approach uh, on modeling and experiment can be able to address the challenges that we face um, at the moment. So I just wanted to give that comment and know that uh, from a CHPC point of view, we keep on supporting this type of work and we wish that uh, all this uh, aspired um, uh, outcomes can be achieved. They will lead the country to solve each of our problems. Thank you very much and good luck with uh, everything that you do. Thank you very much, Happy. And if I may say, CHPC were one of the first people to give me a grant when I came back to get this work going with um, the computations and the computational modeling. So thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Edward, back to you. Still thinking about whether there is any clothing activity going on in the I think I will. Uh, <laughs> so, if there are no comments, I would like to thank Marabaho very, very much. I would like to thank everybody that joined us in, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, session. I want to thank uh, Alicia, if she's still on, for not only introducing Mariboko, but working with her very, very uh, closely. And thank you all. Um, you can go out of here thinking of yourself as a pump and pipes. <laughs> and, and, and I think she's also mentioned that several drugs that can deal with the anticoagulation and, and things. So, uh, and make sure that the doctor doesn't tell you that we are monitoring um, something. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much. And we look forward to the <laughs> for those who are here, can we go for a glass of wine, a um, glass of water, and something to eat? Thank <laughs> you.